All right, uh, then welcome back everybody here to the room. We are about to start now our first fireside chat. Uh, and of course, also, I will once again encourage everybody to ask your questions because we are going to uh, talk about now um, on AI as an existential risk, fundamental rights uh, in the perspective of the humanity. Uh, here on the stage, um, we have already Jan Dallin who is the founding engineer of uh, Skype, and he's also co-founder. Um, he's also the co-founder and works at the uh, Cambridge Center for the Study of Existential Risk and Future Life Institute uh, from Estonia. And then also we have here um, Dr. Paloma Kreutupai. Um, she's the lecturer of constitutional law at the University of Tartu, and besides this, also chairperson of the board of the Estonian Human Rights Center. So I wish you a very nice discussion here on the stage. And once again, everybody here about in a room and joining online, uh, you can ask your questions as well uh, to the Q&A section there. So thank you also and hello from my side to the public here, to the, everyone on site and online. Uh, we were already so nicely introduced, so I can actually write, proceed uh, to our discussion. And was, as was already said, uh, this is a nice opportunity for me, and I feel really happy and honored to ha have been invited to this uh, fireside chat with Jan Thailin who actually, as I just read in an article, is called also a superstar of the IT world. But uh, if you have questions, send them to us. We will try to include them into our talk. Actually, Jan is also an angel investor and philanthropically, he supports existential risk research organizations. And who has uh, read the CV? on the conference homepage has seen that he is co-founder of the Cambridge Center for Study of Existential Risk and the Future of Life Institute. And I actually Googled it um, to help us a bit. And what I found as an information on the internet was that the Center for the Study of Existential Risk is a research center at the University of Cambridge intended to study possible extinction level threats posed by present or future technology. And the Future of Life Institute is a nonprofit organization that works to reduce global catastrophic and existential risks facing humanity, particularly existential risks from advanced artificial intelligence. And so I wondered, I have read that uh, Yu Yan started programming actually already as a teenager, made later your hobby a profession, became programmer, uh, one of the co-architects of Skype. Um, how come that today actually, you are co-founder of these institutions. Um, was there a point where you felt that there's a special risk coming from AI? Was it um, something you experienced? Yeah, I think the institutes are kind of like logical conclusion uh, to uh, what happened around 2008, seven, eight, nine. Um, when I was sort of like scaling back my involvement in Skype and uh, was just like looking around in the, on the internet, like what's, what else interesting is, is there. And then I stumbled upon the writings of Eliezer Rutkowski, uh, who already back then was going like, hello, that the default outcome from AI is not going to be good for us. Like, what, are, are we asleep behind the, wheel, on, behind the wheel or what? And then I just like read his arguments and I was like, wait a minute, that guy is just right. Like what, like what, <laughs> what's, what's, what's happening indeed? And I uh, met up with him in 2009. And the first kind of philanthropic donation I did was, was to his institute back then. But then I kind of sat back and thought, okay, what can I do? And I realized that the people who have been kind of warning about AI, uh, they were basically like nobodies. Uh, they, uh, they didn't have like any kind of street cred. And then I thought, okay, I, what I can do is basically use my 
brand as someone uh, who has contributed to Skype and kind of like turn around and say like, look, even those, the people making those arguments are weird. These arguments are real. Like we're going to face an existential crisis now. And, uh, and uh, both um, Max Tegmark, who is my co-founder at Future Life Institute, and Hugh Price, who is my co-founder at the Cambridge uh, Center for the Study of Existential Risk, basically uh, decided that, okay, like we need to do something about it after, after talking to me. So it's, uh, it, it was a basic, and, and Hugh, Hugh Price even has written like a new New York Times article about, uh, it was like cabs in Copenhagen, uh, my road to existential risk, where he basically describes how our, our kind of chance conversation in, in a Copenhagen cab. Uh, like uh, made him to take this topic seriously. Okay, I I uh, actually just stumbled um, over a risk report from the World Economic Forum mm -hmm. um, and looked at the numbers. I don't know somewhere on Facebook who had posted it, and it listed there the ten biggest risks in the next two years and the next ten years. And actually, it was risk perception survey. So and most of the points Dale, uh, dealt with uh, natural disasters, mm -hmm. with um, yeah problems, also socioeconomic um, confrontations, but uh, none of these problems talked about technology, not in two nor in 10 years. Um, what do you think are, we misled? Are we underestimating the problems that we might soon face, or are they to come in the later future? Oh yeah, like uh, we are. I think, I think it's a, just the same um, phenomenon that like uh, I found now, like fifteen years ago. Uh, where like, yep, this is like clearly very simple arguments. Uh, that like every person kind of individually could understand, but if you're put in, together in a group, you have like kind of social dynamics and politics take over. And then like what matters is like uh, how, like for example, one thing that really matters is like how legible is the risk, how and how kind of easy it is to make a common knowledge. So in that sense, like uh, currently the biggest risk that is legible is global warming. That's why it kind of like uh, acknowledged that this is like a big deal. Uh, but like AI risk is just not like nowhere near as legible as, as global warming is. So like people who are basically realized, but wait a minute, this is a big deal. Like they face like a massive struggle uh, pointing to it because like people, especially like in Western uh, hemisphere, I find is that people like high up, they tend to be less technical uh, and therefore like it's kind of like for them, like, I don't know. I'm a physicist. I think that the world is made of atoms. Uh, so if something happens to atoms, like that's really bad news for us. Whereas like people at World Economic Forum, is, they might think that like, oh, atoms, this is something that chemists work with. So like, I shouldn't be worried about that. Okay. But actually dealing with AI, we're here talking about discrimination, okay, um, data protection, but you co-founded uh, institutes that deal with existential risk. Mm -hmm. So uh, what do you mean with that? What is the risk stemming from AI or, or where is it coming from? Yeah, yeah. explain it. So there are like so many ways to frame this, uh, but I think the most uh, robust way to frame it uh, is that it's really bad idea to share a physical environment with some agent that is smarter than you, that has like particular preferences over the future. And it's better at planning towards those uh, futures. Uh, so, like uh, it just we just don't have to look far. Like look at kind of other primates. Like where are they? Uh, how are they doing? Like what happens? Like to what degree their preferences are going to be represented? Uh, like like the the reason why they have like any hope to survive at all is that humans empathize uh, with with like we, we do empathize with gorillas and apparently they're doing better now than they were doing like twenty years ago uh, because like they're just like. The, pretty much us like there isn't like that big difference between us and us and gorillas so like there's like our kind of empathy circuits in our brain basically in some ways are the proxy by which they can uh like have like a slice of the future uh a friend of mine tim urban who writes uh the blog wait but why he had this like great 
intuition pump saying that like if you think about smart AI, don't think about don't imagine a smart human imagine a smart spider because then you will get like much better intuitions what what could go wrong with ai spiders are just like close cousins compared to ai because like with spiders we share like most of the evolutionary uh tree whereas ai will not we will uh, we will share nothing pretty much but now how do you get to that usually has been said here before we are still using ai as a tool mm -hmm. to decide for risk assessment to um, produce beautiful pictures whatever and so there can be problems but these are very specific how should i understand to get to this broader problems that are they are really becoming smarter than us in a general sense not just mm -hmm. speaking about i don't know translating better than me on deep or something yeah so it's so one sort of again so many ways to frame this but like uh, one way that i found is kind of useful uh, to frame it to people who are not necessarily technical but like are going to uh, have like experience uh, leading people for example uh, such as like world economic forum people um, is that you can think of AI as automated decision making uh, system uh, and you can kind of uh, think about like like every second on this planet uh, like how many decisions are made uh, and like what is the fraction of those decisions that are made by biological entities and what is the fraction of of those decisions that are made by AI uh, so like in some ways we are kind of uh, building alien minds and delegating to them. And that's like every kind of decision maker knows or every kind of leader knows so whenever you delegate something, uh, the, like you will necessarily yield some control over the outcome uh, because you can't, you can't uh, know like all the, all the details, what, what is happening there. Uh, so like currently, like the, um, thing with tools is that they are like very kind of domain specific. Uh, so we can be like reasonably sure that if we delegate to a certain tool in order to generate like image or something, uh, like uh, this thing is not going to kind of like uh, hack into the, uh, into the nuclear arsenals or, or start producing uh, uh, nanotechnology in order to take over the environment. Uh, but like those guarantees are basically mostly because this thing is dumb. Uh, it just doesn't know how to uh, like if you have an image generator it just doesn't know how to do how to do anything beyond images uh, but uh, uh, this is now changing really quickly uh, because like the tools we recently are seeing they're becoming more and more general in the sense that their knowledge is, is called transfer learning like if they learn something in one domain how well can, they can uh, you know, apply that knowledge in in different domains so like yeah that the big problem is that we are delegating away more and more of our decisions and thereby yielding more and more control to effectively alien minds on this planet. Okay, but thinking of the control, I have a very naive question if we're thinking of this really existential risk, not just, I don't know, something yeah, gone not working correctly as a risk assessment, for example, gone wrong. So, wouldn't I still always have as a human the possibility to just pull the plug? Yeah, to, to, what, to that, like I have two answers. Like one is that uh, two years ago, uh, there was a fire in Strasbourg uh, data center uh, and the uh, data center burned down to the ground. And the reason for that was that there was no off button. There was no way to turn off the electricity in that data center. So like people who say that can't we always pull the plug is like, have you tried? Uh, and like the, the more kind of a general answer is that uh, like pulling the plug like implicitly assumes that the system is not modeling the plug. It doesn't like it's kind of like when it's planning, it doesn't look at like what is the state of the plug and what's going to happen. And if it kind of once it like is aware of the plug, it's and it's trivial for it, it to be aware of the plug because like the way the current large language models are trained, uh, they are trained by scraping the internet that so like it has all the information about AI it has a, a 
has information about what is the control problem, what are the humans worried about, like what what can be done in order to kind of circumvent and things. So like it has all the knowledge, so it needs, needs to uh, connect the dots. Uh, so uh, so yeah, like it's I think it's a very precarious to kind of like assume that this will continue, that AI will not be aware uh, what happens if the, if the, if the if it's turned off. I mean, I can have like AI in my pocket. I can ask it, like, and I'm pretty sure it it, it is it it will give an answer uh, that it that it shows that it it knows it knows uh, what's going to happen if if it's, if, it's pull, if the plug is pulled. But that does imply that it will definitely um, have a negative effect, so that it will become a danger. Um, why yeah. is that so or does it have to be so couldn't we say it doesn't have to be like that that's like the entire kind of the field of ai alignment that is now kind of explosively growing unfortunately still like a couple of orders of magnitude behind like ai capabilities research uh like this is the central thing like what is the like in some ways i kind of keep comparing ai to aliens uh, but like there's like one crucial difference between aliens and ai uh ai with AI, we have, at least in theory, this degree of freedom of what kind of minds will be summoned. Whereas like if you see an alien planet, alien ship approaching, then it's like, we have like no control of, over what, what exactly is going to be uh, in that ship. Uh, so like the question is like, like how can we figure out quickly enough uh, how to use this kind of degree of freedom? What kind of minds will be summoned on this planet? And turns out it's a super hard problem. People have worked on it for, some people have worked to, for like 20 years and it's just like not made a lot of progress uh like how how can we in principle uh control processes that are currently the, the way i had this developed is, is like just super simple like for example there is like some people complain rightly so that the people who are working on ai they tend to be like very kind of narrow in terms of demographic and in terms of background uh basically nerds in silicon valley uh and then say like they kind of assume that uh, this means that they're like AI will basically be a nerd from Silicon Valley. Uh, it's like, no, like, the, like you just have to look at like how AI, if you look at like how AI is actually developed, the process is just super simple. There is like no way, no, no point in any, any of that, uh, within that process, there is no point where it, where it kind of like Sil Silicon Valley nerds can go, okay, now let's make it like Silicon, Silicon Valley nerd. No, it's just like, set up like this like, general uh, gradient descent environment. And like the code is just, Hundred lines or something like that. There is not. There is nothing there uh, that uh, uh, kind of like makes it. Uh, uh, that basically, that basically, what I'm pointing out is that the, currently the way AI, the way AI is trained is super simple and super general. There is we're not actually seeing a point where we could we could exercise what kind of minds we can summon. Like the like we need like much more sophisticated process for generating AIs in order to actually have this control over what kind of minds we are going to create. Now the problem with uh, um, with not having not kind of using this uh, uh, slider uh, is that we are going to get effectively like random minds uh, like whatever like the like the, the process that's using uh, the process that we are using to generate AI is called uh, uh, S S G D. Uh, stochastic gradient descent. Stochastic means random. Uh, so we're going to get random minds. Uh, and the problem with random minds is that like humans are very, very sensitive to changes in the environment. So like you like global warming is like, we're talking about like, like something like five degree uh, change uh, in the environment, uh, in the temperature aspect of the environment, which is a like big deal for humans. In cosmic scale, where AI will start thinking about like, should I turn off the sun in order to uh, pull out the hydrogen in order to, I fuse it myself because like the average output of the of the sun energy output of the sun per kilogram is less than that of a compost heap uh like temperatures temperature change like five degrees so it's just less than rounding error so yeah we, are, we should be very worried about uh, about the random minds mm -hmm. you actually mentioned you were um ai alignment uh could you briefly explain what that means mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is like the uh, sort of the most general uh, 
title uh, for what I just said, like uh, how can we use this uh, slider of uh, to someone which kind of uh, mind we would want. And like one argument is that like the slider has to be like tied like very, very precisely in order to give us like any hope of survival. Uh, again, because like the changes, even like slight preference, uh, preference uh, differences uh, would uh, kind of be like super detrimental, just like other species can can vouch. Like I mean, the preferences differences between humans and and chimps are just completely almost like non-existent compared to uh, what what they could be, and like yet uh, other primates find themselves in a very precarious situation. Uh, so so a alignment is yeah basically figuring out how can we how can we design processes that a kind of give this uh, ability uh, for us to uh, have some control over what is the output of this AI training process. Uh, and more, perhaps more interestingly, how can we kind of use the AI itself to uh, kind of uh, have this dial dialed uh, kind of more precisely. So as, it, as AI gets smarter, it like, we know it's, it's kind of pretty simple to make this argument that like what, once AI is smart enough, it will know what humans want or what humans should want if we were smarter and that's actually the first of the kind of counter arguments to like worry about ai is that um, the additional counter arguments is that like wait a minute why are you worried about uh, superhuman superhuman minds if they're superhuman they will know uh, like what humans should want and and but the counter argument that counter argument is like sure of course it, it will know what humans want uh, unless it basically just uh kind of leave frogs humans and goes like one pro okay so many things to say. Uh, one one big problem with, with AI is that like AI runs insanely more fast than humans. Uh, so there is like this great video, uh, series of videos uh, called by Stainless uh, by uh, Adam Magyar, like a uh, uh, Hungarian uh, photographer, where like humans are depicted in slow motion, only like fifty times faster, and like basically statues already at fifty times. AI could be potentially one billion times faster. Uh, so, like, th this is a separate question that that whether human whether AI even bothers modeling humans other than bags of atoms, but if it does, uh, then it will know what humans want. Uh, now, the question is: so, the in that scenario, the quest question isn't so much about AI being dumb enough to not know what humans want. The brief, brief question is: how can we motivate AI to uh, follow what uh, what humans want? What it has figured out about humans? How how can we kind of make the greatest their link between AI capabilities and AI motivation. Actually, thank you. Yeah. Very interesting topic. I. By the way, I meta note that's. I, I think it's it's uh, one thing that I find like super frustrating is that these these topics are just like insanely interesting, and like currently almost all the work on this it happens like in uh, Berkeley, London, Oxford, Cambridge, uh, San Francisco. Uh, it's like. Guys, this is super interesting. This is like the most important thing to be working on. I mean, I don't want like everybody working on this. Obviously, this should be like division of labor. <laughs> but it's like some people should be working on it outside of those centers. This connects to the question actually that came in here and um, that I also asked myself. Um, the question is how we can like how can we make this threat more tangible for society? And and I also thought because we see only. I don't know, usually we're not trained to see the threats because if you look at the policy papers of, mm -hmm. of the countries of EU, we see like uh, we should get faster and more uh, AI and using it more. So very rarely we deal with the risks. Yeah, I mean, there is like competitive pressure. Like uh, again, when you think about AI as uh, automated decision making, and uh, AI adoption as delegating uh, to automated decision making, like there is a competitive pressure to do that, uh, which is like uh, you want kind of like competent decisions quicker. Uh, I think Eric Schmidt, uh, who was here for the Tallinn Digital Thing uh, conference, and uh, like uh, he, we kind of like agree on on many things, but like one thing that we well, sorry, we disagree about many things, but one thing that I definitely agree with him uh, is that like he's very worried about military uh, because there is like very kind of clear competitive pressure to make like really quick uh, decisions. Uh, hence, there's like a lot of pressure to delegate uh, things to machines. 
Uh, luckily, so far, machines have not been as reliable as kind of human human systems. That has like stopped military to going going all in, but like that that obstacle is kind of like being removed now. So uh, so yeah, there is. Uh, I kind of forget the question now, but like, yeah, that there is like how, this. Yeah, can how can we make it more tangible, or how do you feel? Yeah, how can you help uh, people seeing or discussing these problems also? Make so the mission to that particular question, I think my answer is that uh, um, um, myself, I've done things like invested in AI labs and just like hung around in their kitchens uh, to talk about yeah, it we all can do because it. I again like. Fortunately or unfortunately, uh, the future of AI is going to be decided on those in those kitchens currently, uh, to, to, to the degree that it's decided at all. Again, I said like it's mostly just like random and and stochastic uh, the the outcome. But uh, uh, so like in sense, that sense, it's not like completely obvious uh, what uh, the people on, like on the street, so to speak, can do about it. Uh, so, uh, but like. Uh, um, so, so in some sense, I'm deliberately haven't like put a lot of effort into this like kind of wide scale awareness. It's possible that there might be some useful uh, ways to kind of like channel the wide scale awareness, but I yeah I think this argument still needs to be made uh, versus like just yeah like talking to the people directly. The um, some some other thing to want to say, um, but I think I forget. Uh, Oh yeah, like one one thing is that AI itself is going to uh, make uh, make it sort of more obvious that we're dealing with alien minds now, uh, and we shouldn't. It's it's by day it gets less and less clear uh, that uh, that we are dealing with yet another tool. Uh, like I mean, the interesting thing about the incident last year, where like a Google engineer uh, kind of. Uh, went viral uh, claiming that AI is conscious and and uh, and uh, and should be like kind of treated uh, with respect it should have rights uh, it's not about like the interesting thing isn't about this object of a question was this particular system conscious or not the interesting question is the interesting observation is that like we are going to have more and more of those now like with each every with next every next generation which like currently lasts about six months and then we probably become faster like we will have qualitative jumps uh in in like uh, people's perception of oh fuck what is this thing and um uh so like there is this uh, article uh that i recommend on less wrong called uh what it feels to have your mind hacked by ai uh, and these experiences will be like more and more common and, and i i don't actually know how, how what is the so in that, in some sense, there will be awareness. I don't know if that will be like productive uh, awareness that can be channeled into into good outcomes. Okay, I see we're running out of time, but actually, uh, yeah, there's much food for thought you brought here. Maybe even a bit frightening food for thoughts. And so that has been like on my professional side for the last <laughs> more than a decade to like frighten people. <laughs> I have, yeah, and I was just reminded because you also mentioned Eliza Yudkowsky, um, an I, uh, AI researcher, and actually I, I read an article that said uh, that uh, there's actually not much left to do but die in dignity. <laughs> that does it. not sound very optimistic. Uh, do you, are, are you more optimistic about what we can do about uh, AI? finding out, uh, thinking of alignment, or on what note would you end our talk here? Yeah, so uh, I had like this conversation with one of my portfolio CEOs who was kind of very depressed, like after having been working on his startup and then going like, wait a minute, this is all, all for naught, uh, <laughs> because now we're going to die. Uh, and then then I I basically, okay, let's sit down and do the math. Like, uh, like what is the probability that we're going to die uh, as a result of AI? He was like, hmm. 99%. And then I was like, okay, so how much better you think the world could be? And he was like, oh, a million times easily. And then he's like, okay, let's do the math. Like, in, in, according to these numbers, your, your expectation for the future is that the future is going to be something like 10,000 times better uh, than, uh, than the present because 90, like 1% 
of uh, 1 million is 10,000. Uh, so uh, sort of <laughs> in expectation, the future is still great. Uh, and like the way to kind of frame it is that we are living a lottery ticket uh, and like it is our, in our power, it seems still uh, to influence the odds uh, of like making the loss less likely. So I think uh, this sounds better than <laughs> die in dignity. This is a more optimistic note on which we can even conclude and let the next speaker on the stage. Thank you so much, Jan Dali, for this talk.